Good morning and welcome back. Here's what we're focusing on this half an hour. Amazon constantly blamed for all the change our region is undergoing, but small and medium sized businesses have a huge impact here as well. How those business owners are helping us hold on to our values ahead. Also, we used to brag about how much sleep we went without, <laughs> but no more. Next, how sleep has become a status symbol and what it means for anybody who needs a little more. Kind of a relief, I felt like. <laughs> and it turns out kids in the Netherlands may be the happiest in the world. What are Dutch parents doing right that the rest of us are doing wrong? I'm taking notes on that. <laughs> Later in the show, he represented our state in the U.S. Senate for two decades. During a more, let's be honest, civil time in politics, what does Slade Gordon, Gorton think about the fixing partisan gridlock in D.C.? Does he have the answers? He might. He might. We'll ask him. Looking forward to that. And yeah. Tyler, what are we asking folks on Facebook as we stream live this morning? We want to know what's the best or worst parenting advice you've ever gotten. Head to our Facebook Live. We'll read some of those answers coming up. Have at it, folks. Please do. <laughs> but first, just about everyone, and maybe you love it, but it's, it's about time the rain went away. Yeah, that's yeah. right. We have had so much rain this winter. <sighs> Look, we've got to have a sunny summer, right? That's what it's got to mean. <laughs> oh, well, we ask MJ, and she says, not so fast are not really correlated to our summers at all. So the fact that we had a really wet and long winter doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have a longer summer. Our summers are usually sunny and mild around here. So fingers crossed. I can tell you that the long range predictions out of the Environmental Prediction Center in Maryland are saying, take a look at this, the oranges here in Washington state above normal temperatures for June, July and August. Fingers crossed. See, it is a fingers crossed situation. I love it. But we've been ping ponging back and forth between like seven rainy days, one semi sunny day. So we had to ask MJ, when might the next time be, if ever, that we'll see a longer stretch of sunshine? I don't know for sure, but I can pretty much guarantee by July 5th. No, that is not soon no. enough. No, not soon it's enough. It's always July 5th. Oh, that is the one consistent thing in Western Washington. Sun. July 5th through September, I don't know, 22nd. I know. And then something. we always get like a peak of sun again, like October yeah. 10th. Right. Oh, well. Well, we told you about this earlier. We keep hearing about how Amazon, for example, is changing the face of Seattle and by extension, really the entire region. So this week, uh, Business Insider ran this story, which we know people have been sharing online around here. Amazon is taking on Seattle, taking over Seattle. Residents are calling it. Amageddon. Amageddon. I know. That is, uh, Frightening, right? It's harsh. Now, while we agree all the new buildings and new employees tied directly to the company matter, we also wanted to dig a little bit further into small and medium-sized businesses and how they impact this place that we call home. Louise Chernin, the president and CEO of the Greater Seattle Business Association, or the GSBA, represents more than 1,100 small business, corporate, and nonprofit members in our area who promote equality and diversity. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. So let's mm -hmm. start with impact. I mean, your members really are the folks feet on the ground who are impacting our culture and our economy around here. Absolutely. We are one of the oldest LGBT chambers of commerce in the United States, and we are the largest. And Many chambers are shrinking at, at this time, but GSBA is vibrant and growing. And I think that's because we're a values-led chamber of commerce. We believe that businesses, they, especially small businesses, they're part of your community. They are the, the places where, that hire local people, where they donate to the local nonprofits and organizations. Uh, so our organization is really uh, thriving at this time, and we're very excited. We believe uh, and finally, corporations are keeping up with our values, but we started talking about equality is good business 36 years ago. We are still talking about it. Now people, people are realizing who run companies, corporations, that if we're going to be successful in this day and age, we have to be diverse. We have to talk about equity. We have to ensure that our customer base and our employee base are diverse and welcoming so that we can compete in a new global economy. But small businesses get that more than anybody else. And so uh, we are proud to be a business voice for small business. And we're also proud that many of the corporations, I do want to say a good word about them in our region, are very progressive corporations. And in GSBA, we have the support of those corporations. And really, some of them really enable us to provide the programming that we do for small businesses, because they provide some financial support. Small business owners, they have no time for anything. They're up early in the morning. They don't go to <laughs> yes, meetings. Right, you know, right. People want to yeah. say they network all the time. No, they're really trying to keep the doors open yeah. all the time. 
probably the biggest challenges in terms of corporate influence is the rising rents. Commercial rents are very, very hard. The amount of construction that's right in front of the door of a small business person, um, you know, whether it's crime and, and street issues, those are things that really affect small businesses. So the more that they can have a voice, um, for example, this is the first time GSBA hired a lobbyist ever, but we realize there is a lack of a small business voice, not just in the city, but in the state as well. Everybody says small businesses are a treasurer. They truly are the largest employer mm -hmm. in the country. And yet we actually don't show that by how welcoming and easy we make it. Things are complicated. Uh, taxes uh, for small businesses, our are, are, are B&O taxes are based on gross and not net profits. Um, all the new changes that are very important for employees and that we support being a values and progressive based business organization are very challenging when you are a small or micro business. So, um, so we are excited. We are also an organization that in addition to supporting business, recognize that philanthropy is an integral part of the success of business. And we have one of the largest scholarship funds in the United States and give out over $400,000 a year to LGBT and allied students. So we really are a, an organization that's about community, it's about business, uh, it's about philanthropy, uh, and it's about advocacy. So um, we, we see the corporations that are here as partners with us. And this is going to have an impact on the future. Very quickly, where do you see the future of business going because of the diverse impact that you're having on the community? Well, I'm hoping the future of small business is good. And so that's why we have to keep talking to our city council members, our county council members, and our state uh, representatives and federal government to understand that when you make new rules and regulations, and you're a small business owner, you don't have a finance department, you don't have an HR department, and so you don't even know how to implement some of those things. So we have really been going and asking for support from our city and our state to say, help us help the small businesses understand the new laws, the new regulations. Let's work to try to stabilize some kind of commercial rent for small businesses, and um, let's promote them because they really are the jewels of our economy. And um, so we, we're looking for a good future. We like it. Yeah. And we like everything that you bring to our city and to our region. Louise Turner with the GSBA, largest gay and lesbian uh, chamber of commerce anywhere in North America. Yeah, we think the world. Fabulous. And we are allied too, so we do welcome everybody. Thank, Thank you for so being much. here yeah. this morning. Thank we you. appreciate it. We have a question for all of you. Is sleep, perchance, the new status symbol? Well, that's the actual title of an article in the New York Times this week. It's an article about sleep. And by the way, the article about sleep is in the fashion and style section. Here's what? why. I know, that's what my reaction was, too. Engineers, psychologists, and neurologists all around the world coming up with fashionable products like these. Take a look at your screen there. It's all in the name of getting a better night's rest. That's a white designer globe called The Sense. It purportedly measures air quality in your bedroom and then suggests changes to help you sleep by indicating whether your air is less than ideal. Then you have the Retimer, which are goggles that use tiny green-blue lights that shine back into your eyes to allegedly reset your body clock. The Australian entrepreneur behind it says he's sold 30,000 pairs in 40 countries since 2012. And he has another sleep product, sleep fashion, if you will, coming out this <laughs> summer. The next invention is this, the Thim. It's a wearable ring that tracks the minute you fall asleep, then wakes you up every three minutes for the next hour, allegedly training your body to fall asleep sooner on its own over time. So why is this suddenly a thing? <laughs> why is it in the fashion section? It's all very excellent questions. <laughs> questions I continue to ask myself yes. as I look through all of this. Well, learning to get sleep is becoming more trendy. Some, trendy. Something that we mentioned at the top of the show is it used to be kind of a trendy thing to say, oh, I got two hours of sleep right. and I'm functioning on a pot of you. Look at me. <laughs> But sleeplessness has become officially a public concern according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. More and more people are seeing it as a measure of success because it's something you can actually control. So everyone's trying to capitalize on the money-making scheme. I like more sleep. So if that's fashionable, I'm fashionable. Congratulations. And I'm, I'm, I'm in on that. <laughs> you win. <laughs> Speaking of trends, we also learned this week, you pointed this out, I think this is crazy and interesting. Should all parents around here be taking advice from the Dutch? Maybe. Here's the post, Washington post this uh, citing this new book um, about the happiest kids. That's the title of this new book. Happiest Kids in the World, written by two expat moms raising their kids in the Netherlands with their Dutch husbands. So in this book, they cite a Dutch expression that declares babies need three things, rest, 
regularity and cleanliness. That's it. I think adults need that too. <laughs> yes. This means predictable, predictable routines, outings, no more than once a day, and no outside distractions. Childhood in general for the Dutch means less academic stress and more of a focus on things like freedom and play. In other words, to the Dutch, raising kids is about simplifying and creating a balance, not pushing your kids to do too many activities, but this also leads to a bigger work-life balance for parents as well. Nearly half of the population in the Netherlands, I did not know this, works part-time. Isn't that amazing? Um, sign me up. Yeah. Full-time jobs there, though, even if you're working full-time, that's still just 36 hours a week, not Only. 87 hours a week or whatever it is here. When I got to that part, I thought, well, see, that's why it's so difficult for us to adopt that. It's it's one thing to say, just work part-time. Yeah. You know, the structure here in the U.S. Is, is not really conducive to that as much, so that's hard. Right, because, look, if your kid gets sick, a, a parent there is going to uh, take their sick day as well, which is going to lower stress levels for right. everybody, but for us, it's easier said than done. So maybe it's better if we look at the Dutch and we say, well, we can adopt the simplifying approach, yeah. the sort of don't over schedule approach, and we could find a happy medium for being Americans <laughs> and still overworkers. As a parent, are you, do you think this rings true at all? Uh, yeah. yeah. Play is a big deal. We're really emphasizing letting Ellie play as much as possible yeah. and imaginative play and trying to not force lots of structure on her. And we also realize we're being hypocrites. Tyler, we want to bring you into We're talking <laughs> yeah, about this on Facebook. We're not giving people parental advice, but that's something a lot of people still get anyway. Yes, we're soliciting it, though. We want to know your best and worst pieces of advice that you've ever gotten. Here's one. Jonathan says, the worst piece of advice he got was never say no to your child. But we want to know some of the best responses and uh, uh, the best pieces of advice you've ever gotten. So I head say, to our Facebook Live and let us know. I say no to Ellie every day. Yeah, no I, kidding. I, uh, I was told no every day of my childhood. Right. <laughs> Thank you. We'll check back with you. So um, Slade Gorton, senator in D.C. for two decades. Well, you know, it was a time when laws got passed and debate was civil. I remember watching it as a child. But what happened and what can we do about it? Senator Gorton is joining us live on the couch so we can ask him just on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. So President Trump told Fox Business this week he still wants to tackle health care before tax reform. A lot of people asking, though, is that really feasible with Congress still in such gridlock? Yeah, Slade Gorton represented Washington for two decades in the U.S. Senate. He is here with us this morning to help us sort of sort out how we actually got here. You were there in a day when it was civil and, and things got done. Did you see change over your 20 years in, in the Senate? There was some, but it was postponed. Two things have happened, it seems to me. The first is, when I was in the Senate, there were at least half a dozen Republicans who were more liberal than the most conservative Democrats, and half a dozen Democrats who were more conservative than the most liberal Republicans. That's almost totally gone now due to elections. And the second thing is, in the last few years that uh, I was there, and for a very short time thereafter, uh, the Republican leader, Senator Lott, and the Democratic leader, Senator Daschle, actually were good friends with one another. They could be opponents politically, but they weren't enemies. Uh, and uh, uh, that's not really quite the case now. Why is that, do you think? You left the Senate in 2001. What have you seen in the years since as far as why things might be changing the way they have been? Polarization among the American people. Mm. You know, the bitterness of the last uh, presidential campaign and the like. Uh, there are fewer people in politics and unfortunately probably fewer people outside of politics who want to just talk about politics. They want to argue about it and demonize their opponents. It feels like politics, I mean, politics is at its base personal. That's true. But arguing politics or debating politics or legislating, maybe it's not so good that that's personal and it's become so personal. Yes, uh, I, I, that's, a good, that's a good comment. It, it, what, so you, one of the recent sort of things I think that has happened that has people saying is this getting worse is the uh, Senate uh, decision to get rid of the filibuster for Supreme Court justices. We read that you were advising the Senate Majority Leader that that was, that was a, something he should probably do. I'm curious about why you think that's a good and thing. And I think he should go further. Yeah, tell you know, us about than, that. Than has. The filibuster historically were used at the, was used at the end of long debates on very serious questions. But beginning you know, when I was there, it began, it was extended to more and more things, to 
it's a, to the confirmation of assistant secretaries of state and, and the like. And even to the proposition that you would bring an issue up. Republicans did it when they were in a majority. Democrats did it when they were in a majority. But the big change uh, was Senator Reid, Democratic leader, about six or eight years ago, changed the rules so that the filibuster rule itself could be removed by a simple majority vote. And he removed it to all appointments by the president except for the United States Supreme Court. Well, you sow the wind, you reap the, reap the whirlwind. Uh, when the Democrats decided uh, to uh, uh, filibuster Judge Gorsuch, um, Senator McConnell said, fine, we'll change it. It'll only take 51 votes, a simple majority of the Senate, to end that debate and to, uh, and, and, and to confirm Judge Gorsuch. I think it was a terrible mistake on the part of the Democrats to take that issue on when the candidate himself was so highly qualified. They would have done a lot better to have saved it for a different day. Uh, but it'll come up again because health care that you talked about at the beginning of this uh, segment, tax reform, none of those issues can be brought up now without getting a bipartisan majority in the Senate. And that bipartisan majority doesn't seem to be there. What do you think the state is? This is an, um, an overly broad question, and I apologize, but if anyone can begin to answer it, it's you. What, what do you think is the state of each of the political parties, where we stand right now? You mentioned the Democrats and deciding to, to go for it and debate Neil Gorsuch for, you know, over maybe valuing a different debate. And a lot of Democrats came out and said, this is our way of showing our constituents that we're ready to fight for, for some of their beliefs. But both parties have seemed fractured off and on over the last couple of years, especially with the recent presidential election. What, what's next for the parties? Uh, the parties didn't reflect the people of the United States very well last year. Uh, for the first time in my long life, I voted for neither of the, uh, really? uh, the major party candidates uh, for president because the party organizations tend to move to the extreme. The Republicans to the right, the Democrats to the left. Most of the people of the United States are somewhere in the middle, and their views aren't reflected very well by the way the two political parties are run. So how do we get back to a representative democracy? <laughs> we, well, no, no that, the question is tougher than that. We have representative democracy now. Uh, this split reflects the way most of the people of the United States think. Uh, most of the congressional districts in the United States are one-party districts, not due to gerrymandering, but due to the way that the, the people live and, and where they move. Uh, at one sense, Congress reflects the American people only too well. So it's our own fault. In, so, in a sense, <laughs> in, in, you know, in, in, a, in a sense, it is. And until we start listening to one another, it's hard to express. It, it's hard to hope that the Congress uh, members of Congress are going to do so. How realistic is it that members of Congress will change and that voters will change, or are we looking at a future where we will eventually see multiple parties in a, in a very real way? You know, independent parties, green parties, those have had a harder time gaining a lot of traction in presidential elections. Do you see that changing? Well, they have a hard time getting traction in uh, in congressional elections as true, well. True. <laughs> there are only two or three nominally non-Republican and non-Democratic <laughs> members of either House or Congress. And in fact, uh, even those who call themselves independents are really members of one party uh, you know, or, or, or the other. Uh, members of Congress are as worried about this as, as people are. And many of them are attempting to come up with a way uh, to reach across, uh, reach across the aisle. And maybe the best example of that maybe Senator John McCain from, uh, from Arizona, who it was anything, it was everything as a fierce partisan, you know, when he began uh, in, in Congress, ran for president of the United States. Today is very independent in his views uh, and uh, has a number of followers uh, in the United States Senate at least. Uh, I think we need to hope for a little bit more of that in uh, both houses of Congress. Senator Slade Gordon, it is always a pleasure to have you. Thank you for helping us sort of wrap our minds around it. And as always, yes. it's a take a little bit of the ownership of the problem for ourselves yes. <laughs> before we're pointing too many fingers elsewhere, it sounds like to me. So thank you very much for being here this morning. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you. So coming up, why does Easter fall on a different day every year? It turns out it all has to do with the moon. 
and we're going to explain why. Blame the moon when you forget <laughs> the date. And take a look at your screen. This is our Friday trivia. Take a look. We're going to have the answer for you on the other side of this break. See if you can guess the right answer, because Travis and I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> so take a look at your screen. There's the Friday trivia. How many Cadbury cream eggs are made each year? 50, 100, 250, or 500? We collectively decided whatever the largest number was yes, was going to be our number. guess. The highest, highest number. number. So yep. what is the What's answer? What's the answer? Yeah! <laughs> 300 million. We win! Yay, we get a cream egg or I something. Know. Is this Do the we? first time we've all gotten the trivia right? Yes. I think it might be. Yes, yes. I think so. <laughs> our Congratulations producer loves us. tripping us up. She likes that. Speaking of Cadbury eggs, Easter is this weekend, but the actual date, hey, who are, there's wow. nobody there. Hi. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> the actual date for Easter changes every single year. Yeah, Easter can actually fall between March 22nd and April 25th. A it's got to be yeah. But Easter lands on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. Got that? So the ver an equinox, equinox is the time when the day and the night are the same. Okay. So you got like 12 hours, 12 Equa. hours. Of, exactly. Got and it. that happens twice a year. The vernal, that's in the spring. So are you keeping okay. up so far? Vernal equinox. Yeah. We need flashcards for yeah. this. So for the example, this year the vernal equinox happened on March 20th. The okay. next full moon after that was April 11th. Yeah. So that makes this Sunday Easter. Because it's the Sunday after that Tuesday the 11th. Yeah, I think got it. It. I got it. So basically it's the moon that decides when Easter is and you can count backwards from there. Sure. To get to like Lent and Ash Wednesday yes. and Mardi Gras and all of those things. And guess what? Next year, Easter falls on April Fool's Day, and the last time that happened was 1956. Okay, wow. Tyler, get in here. We yes. want to hear parenting okay. advice. All right, some of the worst advice John says, treat your children like friends. Who's giving that advice? No, that's, that doesn't sound great. No. Chonga says the worst is from someone who does not have kids. Oh. That can be tough, although yeah. sometimes that could be an outside could be perspective. A good perspective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did people have good parenting advice? They did, but a lot of people were talking about vaccines and spanking, some serious topics. Um, what do you guys think about that? I think it depends on where the advice is coming from. Yeah. If it's from a stranger, I need them to tiptoe around it a little bit right. more. Yeah. Not like, here's what you gotta do. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, that, that's the comments on Facebook or the strangers at the park who I'm like, slow down. <laughs> it's not all black and white. Right. Yeah. But my mom, generally, I'll listen to her parenting advice. Oh, I'll bet she's watching. She's Great gonna appreciate advice. that. She's texting me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Again, we are here every Friday at 9.30. Happy Easter.